the country's determination to shape its economic reforms and push it through an irreversible path was evident with the presentation of the 1993 budget. The rupee was made fully convertible on trade account. Several new incentives were given to unshackle the economy and incentives given to attract foreign investments. The year that went by was surely a watershed for the Indian economy. Despite social and political problems, the mood on the whole remained upbeat, even among visiting non-resident Indians. This is the right opportune moment, and that come here immediately, grab the opportunity with all the liberation policy, you are most welcome in this country, and don't miss this chance, otherwise you will be left behind. Investments from abroad increased dramatically, and if one entry symbolized the Indian economy going global, it was the return of Coca-Cola. Armed with a strategic alliance with Pali, India's biggest soft drink manufacturer, Coke was certainly a formidable player, and the frontiers of the cola war between Pepsi and Coke had now been hastily drawn on Indian soil. But the alliance between Coca-Cola and Pali also highlighted one unpleasant fallout of the new economic reforms, and that was the threat to Indian brand names and companies as more and more transnational giants bought out their weaker Indian counterparts. The fear that Indian brand names would disappear and indigenous companies would be marginalized forced many industrialists to argue forcefully for a level playing field. If we have to compete with our foreign counterparts and we would like to do that we are not afraid of that competition Indian industry does not say that do not bring in foreign capital or foreign technology but uh, we must do it on an equal footing whether you call it a level playing field or what have you these fears aside the buzzword throughout the year was economic liberalization and for once the world outside was watching the new developments in India with great interest a series of seminars and delegations marked high-profile investors en route to the country to test the waters. And riding the high waves was Her Majesty the Queen of England's personal yacht, HMY Britannia. On board were over 300 chief executive officers and captains of industry from England buying and selling with their Indian counterparts. A high part pitch, which at the end of the day covered over two billion pounds sterling worth of business. And lent colour to what was in any case a showcasing of a new economic initiative between the two countries. These new liberalisations that have been taking place here over the last two years are transforming the economy of India. This is why we mounted the Indo-British Partnership Initiative. It's extremely important that British companies should take advantage of the liberalisation that's taking place here in India. The World Economic Forum Meet on India, held a month later, analysed the ground realities of the economic reforms initiated in India. While the world welcomed India's moves to go global with its economy, those attending the forum meet felt the pace of reforms was not fast enough. And the Japanese particularly were blunt. The cascade of investment would come, but numerous apprehensions still needed to be addressed. Once India proves to be a good market with suitable business environment, I think you will see a, a very major rush of investment into this country. The Sensex, the true barometer of the country's free market system, is once again bullish. Even if, for most part of the year, it remained coy and fully in the grip of bears, it rallied upwards during the last quarter. This time, led by heavy investments from the foreign institutional investors who have already poured in almost $1 billion into the stock exchanges, which were being disciplined by the Securities and Exchange Board of India, now armed with much greater powers. The elections to the five North Indian states had created a sense of uncertainty in both the political and economic spheres. But when the results showed that the ruling Congress party had worsted their opponents and Prime Minister Narasimha Rao had consolidated his position as supreme leader of the party, the mood was once again optimistic. The GATT talks reminded third world countries of the unequal trading policies that exist in the world of free market systems. 
And although India felt let down by some of the provisions in the Dunkel draft, there was nonetheless a satisfaction that on the whole, the new world trade deal would add to the country's economy with some billions of dollars worth of exports in the years to come. The year, however, was to end with a damper. The Joint Parliamentary Committee's report on the multi-million dollar securities and banking scam was at last tabled in Parliament two weeks back and led to the resignation of Dr. Manmohan Singh, the Finance Minister. Observers were apprehensive that if the resignation was accepted, it may signal the slowing down of the economic reforms. And so, as the country enters the new year, a relevant and obvious question being asked is, what does Indian industry think the coming year will have in store? and permissions or licenses coming, not coming, would be out of the way. So we are really be, uh, releasing a lot of energy uh, in our industry to address uh, the real issues of uh, efficiency, productivity and uh, quality. The remarkable achievement of salvaging the country's economy from the doldrums it had been wallowing in only two years ago is certainly a success story by any yardstick and one worth emulating. 1994 thus begins with this hopeful note that even a repeat performance of a similar nature will ensure that the relentless march of the country's economic recovery would forge ahead. Because it is the economy that will certainly continue to dominate the national agenda.